is going to speak about fine-grained parameterization of tensor network contraction. Is that good? Yeah, good. Uh, so thanks everyone for staying until the uh, last talk of the day. Uh, I'm going to be talking about one way of parameterizing tensor networks that serves as a framework for characterizing the costs of doing tensor network contraction. Sorry. Uh, so a tensor network is a graph to whose vertices we associate tensors. And there's a process called contraction by which we take pairs of tensors and combine them through matrix multiplication to get a new tensor. And if we do this over and over again, eventually get to a single number called the value of the tensor network. And if we think of each of the edges or wires of the tensor network as having a variable associated with it, the value of the tensor network uh, can be expressed like this. So it's a sum over all possible assignments of values to the variables of the product of the tensors at those values. And so another way of thinking about tensor networks is as a graphical representation of quantities that look like this. And so as a very simple example, uh, suppose we have a sequence of matrices whose products we want to compute, uh, sandwiched by a bra and a ket, so that we get a single number. Graphically, it's represented like this. And to get it to look like the expression up top, what we do is insert a resolution of the identity on each wire, uh, and the associated variable indexes the basis state or term in the resolution of the identity. And so tensor networks are very widely applicable. Uh, there was the previous talk. Uh, they're useful for modeling counting problems. So there are tensor networks that represent the number of satisfying assignments in a Boolean formula the number of independent sets in a graph, the number of colorings in a graph, and so on. They're useful for representing partition functions uh, when dealing with uh, thermal states of various systems. Of more, uh, of more relevance here is their use as uh, concise representations of quantum states. Uh, so we have MPS, uh, PEPs, and so on. And they're also useful in representing quantum computations, uh, especially quantum circuits. And I say especially quantum circuits for two reasons. First, uh, quantum circuits just are tensor networks. The gates are tensors, and the qubits or wires are the edges of the tensor network. Uh, but more importantly, they're the motivating application of this work. So my original goal was to better understand uh, the time and space costs of simulating Google's quantum supremacy experiments. Where in this context, simulating, I mean there's a circuit uh, that produces some state, and I'm given some computational basis state, and I want to know the amplitude of that state. And overall, this is essentially computing the value of a particular tensor network. So how hard is it to do this? Uh, in general, very, very hard. Uh, so it's sharp p hard in general. Uh, I can write down a tensor network whose value counts the number of satisfying assignments to a constrained satisfaction problem. Uh, it's also BQP complete, uh, at least a certain type of approximation to it. Uh, and I, I mentioned completeness here uh, rather than just hardness, uh, simply because it's a cool result by Arad and Landau. But all is not lost. Uh, we know of several special classes of tensor networks that are easy to compute. So for example, Clifford's, uh, the Gottesman nil theorem tells us that if our circuit consists entirely of Clifford gates, we can easily simulate it. Uh, Valiant introduced the idea of match gates and showed that uh, planar match gate tensor networks, these are tensor networks whose graph is planar and whose tensors satisfy the match gate identities, uh, these are easy to compute. And also we know that uh, tree tensor networks are easy to compute, at least for bounded degree. Um, and this is all great, but in practice, the tensor networks whose value we want to compute don't always fall into one of these three classes. And so this is where parameterized complexity comes in. So Bravi and Gossett showed that we can simulate a, uh, a quantum circuit 
in time that's exponential only in the number of T's or non-Clifford gates in the circuit. Uh, Bravi showed that we can simulate match gate tensor networks in time that's exponential only in the genus of the surface into which the tensor network is embedded. Uh, where here the genus is some measure of the non-planarity of the surface. And Marco Vinci showed that we can simulate a tensor network in time that's exponential only in the tree width of the line graph of the tensor network. And this last result is actually the jumping off point for the present work. Uh, so the first step is a sort of recharacterization of this result, but in a way that uh, has some advantages and allows for extending in several directions. So the first result is that we can contract a tensor network in time exponential in the vertex congestion of an optimal contraction tree. And as a first pass, this sort of just reformulates Marco Vinci's results. But it has two main advantages. First, it's a little more precise. So the result in terms of tree width captures the exponent. Um, but this characterization in terms of vertex congestion also captures the uh, subdominant factors in the running time. And more importantly, it's much easier to understand. So if you've ever tried to think about a tree decomposition of a line graph, uh, you'll know that it's not the easiest thing to, to think about in reason with. But importantly, the, this characterization in terms of contraction trees also allows us to say something about the space required to do the contraction. And in practice, uh, limits on memory can be at least as important as limits on space. And so we can do tensor network contraction using space or memory that's exponential in the edge congestion of a contraction tree. And we can be even a little more precise and say that the space we need is the cut width of the contraction tree. And finally, the height of these contraction trees tells us something about the time it takes to do the contraction when we can parallelize the individual contractions. So here are two example tensor networks in one dimension one with nearest neighbor edges and another with next nearest neighbor edges. And on the right are the corresponding contraction trees. So a contraction tree is a binary tree that is a tree whose non-leaf edges have degree three and a bijection between the tensors of our network and the leaves of the tree. And for every edge in our tensor network, there are two adjacent tensors corresponding to two leaves of the tree. And what we do is we route this edge through the contraction tree along the unique path connecting the two relevant leaves. And in this context, it'll be more useful to think about weights as being equal to the logarithm of the bond dimension so that they add rather than multiply. And with that, we can define the congestion of a vertex of the contraction tree as the sum of the weights of the edges that are routed through it. And similarly, we can define the congestion of an edge of a contraction tree as the sum of the weights of the edges routed through it. And we say that the overall vertex congestion of a contraction tree is equal to the maximum congestion of a vertex. And similarly, that the edge congestion of the contraction tree is the maximum congestion of an edge in the contraction tree. And I said that the leaves of the contraction tree correspond to tensors of our network. And it turns out that the internal nodes of the contraction tree correspond to contractions that we do at some point in the process. And the congestions of these vertices correspond to the time it takes to do each of these individual contractions. And the edge congestions correspond to the size of the tensors that are created at any point in the uh, contraction procedure. And so another way of thinking about contraction trees is as representations of sets of uh, contraction orders that all share the same time and space costs. Uh, so on the left, there's this picture of a rooted contraction tree where we're restricted to uh, contracting towards the root. And on the right is an unrooted contraction tree where there's no such restrictions. And so we can come from, from either side and, and pick a close pair of leaves and contract them together. Uh, and Overall, we see that the, the total cost of doing so uh, is independent of which way we go about doing things. So here are three different perspectives of the same process. So on the left is matrix multiplication, uh, 
we have two matrices that we multiply together to get a third. In the middle is uh, the same process, but what it looks like in the tensor network itself. So we have these two tensors that we contract together to produce a new tensor, uh, whose neighbors are the same as those of the, the tensors that we contracted together. And then on the right is what this looks like in the contraction tree. So these two leaves correspond to the tensors that we're contracting together. And this internal vertex between them corresponds to the contraction. And when we do the contraction, we no longer have these two original tensors, but we have this new one and a new leaf. And so for practically sized computations, the time it takes to do this matrix multiplication is equal to the product of the three dimensions uh, here, which corresponds to the sum of the weights of all of the relevant edges in the edge contraction, which is exactly equal to the congestion of this internal vertex between the two leaves. And so that's the sense in which the congestion of this vertex gives the time to do this one contraction. So I also said that the uh, congestion of an edge corresponds to the size of a tensor, uh, so that the edge congestion of the contraction tree gives the size of the largest tensor that we have to hold on to at any point in time. But what really matters is a slightly different quantity, which is the total amount of space we need at any one point in time, because we'll have more than one tensor at a time. And so what's shown here is uh, snapshots of a contraction algorithm as it moves from uh, the full tensor network to a single value. And this dotted line uh, indicates uh, by the edges that it crosses the set of tensors that it needs to keep in memory at any particular point in time. And we, what we want to minimize is the total memory of such tensors which turns out to be exactly equivalent to uh, a variant of the cut width of the contraction tree. And so as an example, suppose that we have a tensor network on a 2D grid. Uh, shown here are two different contraction trees. One I'll call a snake, goes from left to right and back as it snakes through the grid. Uh, and the congestion of this snake contraction tree is on the order of uh, is approximately the uh, side length of the grid. And on the right, we have an alternative contraction tree uh, that I'll call a fork, where we contract along one dimension and then the other. Uh, and this has twice the congestion, approximately. Uh, and this factor of two is in the exponent when we talk about the total time and space. And so th this can make a big difference. And while these two different ways of contracting 2D grids uh, and their associated costs that were well known before this work. I think that uh, these contraction trees and the congestion perspective uh, helps us understand what's going on in a visually evident way uh, that we couldn't do with uh, the previously available tools. And so why is it that uh, contraction trees and congestion is the right way of looking at things for tensor networks? Uh, so normally when we think of constraint satisfaction problems as a graph, uh, we think of the variables as corresponding to vertices and the constraints as corresponding to edges or hyperedges. Uh, but in tensor networks, the situation is reversed. So our edges correspond to variables and our vertices correspond to the constraints of the tensors. And so this is why it's, it's appropriate that the right way of characterizing things with tensor networks is in terms of vertex and edge congestions, which are the analog in the line graph of tree width and branch width, where tree width and branch width are the traditionally used quantities for upper bounding the time and space costs of, say, dynamic programming algorithms on trees. And so at this point, I'd like to say a little bit more about the generality of these ideas. So all of the contraction trees that I've showed you thus far have had this linear caterpillar uh, structure, but uh, contraction trees can be any binary tree. Uh, and I've also only showed you tensor networks that are one or two D grids, uh, but these techniques are applicable to graphs with any structure, um, arbitrary non-uniform bond dimensions, uh, and even hyper edges of arbitrary size, uh, as, as in the previous talk. And so to summarize, uh, I've introduced this idea of a contraction tree uh, whose properties capture the costs of tensor network contraction. Uh, so the vertex congestion gives the time, the edge congestion gives the space, the height gives the time when we parallelize the contractions, uh, 
And the cut width gives a, a more precise characterization of the total space that we need. Uh, and so overall, this constitutes a framework for thinking about the time and space costs of tensor network contraction that's useful both in theory for understanding and reasoning about uh, systems that we can model with tensor networks, and also in practice by helping us optimize our computations uh, on such systems. Thanks. So questions? So I have a question. So you mentioned the example of a two-dimensional grid. I'm curious if there are other examples that can kind of illustrate um, how changing the tree or changing the path by which you're contracting um, gives you different uh, parameters and different outcomes. Um, so, so far, um, Basically, usually there are natural ways of contracting things. So if it's a tree, there's a particular tree like, there's a particular contraction tree that's pretty closely matched to the, the tree that constitutes the, the tensor network. Um, and there are also um, similar examples for 3D grids. So there are different combinations of the snake and fork, uh, and this contraction tree picture helps you see why one or the other is better as you go through it. Other questions? Okay, well, let's thank our speaker and all the speakers from the afternoon sessions. Uh, please don't move. Uh, got a few announcements to make. Okay, so since we're past the two-third mark for TQC almost, it makes sense to look ahead. So next year, it's going to be happening uh, in Riga, Latvia, a Wednesday to Friday conference from June 10th to June 12th. Um, so I guess it's in the northern part of Europe, Eastern Europe, and uh, it's a beautiful city and was pitched in Lonely Planet as the top 10 places to visit in 2014 and 2016, and maybe the TQC crowd will make it up for the 2020 time as well. Uh, so it's going to happen in the University of Latvia, which is close to the city center, and looks more like a castle than a university. And there are pretty good connections from other European cities to fly into Latvia, if you're interested. And uh, the chair is going to be Andres Sambenis, who heads the quantum effort uh, at the University of Latvia. And uh, they have conducted previous conferences there, so they hope to throw a great conference next year as well, and maybe even outdo us. Uh, they have some idea for what the comparable registration rates would be, uh, which seems pretty standard, I guess. And um, yeah. More details will be available from the organizers when they have the information. Uh, beyond 2020, uh, bids are also being accepted for 2021. If you're interested, please contact um, the steering committee chair, Aram Harrow, aram at mit.edu. And uh, yeah, that would be great. You can get it to an auditorium near you. Uh, since we are almost at the end, we would appreciate your feedback on the conference, any ideas you have on how TQC can evolve in the future, um, or basically any comments, good or bad, we take them all. And uh, you can find it at the Slack channel, tqc2019conference.slack.com. If you can't access it, you know, if you can find one of us, we'll give you an invite. The channel that we're using specifically is the feedback and future of TQC's channel. Um, feel free also to find us on email or social media, Twitter, and let us know.
So finally, uh, before we head out for the group photo, uh, we would appreciate it if the name tags are kind of left here. You can leave all of your things. We go to the group photo, and then you can come back and take them up again. It's going to be right outside here. And you know, as per the normal rules, the taller people at the back, so everyone can be seen. And after that, we're going to have the conference banquet at 6 PM. Uh, it's going to be at the penthouse level. And uh, there's a beautiful terrace, so feel free to enjoy it even before the banquet starts. There's a cash bar there where you can use your two drink tickets. And beyond that, you, know, you can buy whatever you want. And uh, yeah, see you there. And we can relax and catch up there. <laughs>